Okay, this is our Tuesday night Bible study for uh, February 28th, uh, 2017. We've been going through Gad, and we're in probably about a third of the way done through chapter 1. Chapter 1 is going to take us a little bit of time. I wanted to start out by looking at a verse, because this will come in a little bit today and a little bit more next time, but there's a verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is where Paul is talking about uh, marriage and whether you should stay single or not and the situation that's going on there, that kind of stuff. But he, he doesn't talk just about that, but he says a few interesting things. And he says um, in verse 17, uh, he breaks from the having a wife or not marrying or children or that kind of stuff. And he says, uh, <clears throat> as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all of the churches. Some translations will say this is the rule that I set forth in all of my churches. Okay, that whatever walk of life you were in when you started, you need to stay there. And he, he gives you a couple of uh, extra things. For instance, he says, if you're free, don't try to be enslaved. Obviously, we wouldn't. If you're a slave, be content with it because the Lord may have put you there. However, if you can obtain your freedom, that's not a bad thing. So, you know, if you can, but don't, you know, push it. But he says this. So this, this is the rule he lays out in churches. Next verse, he says, is any, is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. And of course, circumcision, physical circumcision, once you're circumcised, you can't like turn around and correct it by putting it back on. So that's not what he's talking about. He's saying that in, in Judaism, you, you learn from the rabbis, you learn everything there is to know about how you're supposed to do what you're supposed to be doing. And the last stage of a full conversion is circumcision. So when he's talking about this, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles and customs. So basically he's saying if you are a Jew and you're following the law of Moses and then you realize that Jesus actually is the promised Messiah and you start believing in that. He says the Lord placed you in that family as a witness and, and, and that culture. Don't seek to leave it and go become a Gentile. Okay? And if you were born a Gentile, don't seek to leave that and go through a full conversion system and become circumcised. So because you don't now obviously there's exceptions to the rule because Paul himself, you could say, broke his own rule here because he's a, a Jew born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised, kept the law, Pharisee, whole nine yards, but he left that to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? And so somebody else may be called. Uh, into a, a Jewish community. So the Lord can call you in different places, but he's basically just saying in general, if you're Jewish, accept the Messiah, uh, keep your Jewishness. You don't want to abandon that. And if you're a Gentile, don't think that you have to turn around now and convert to Judaism. And that'll come out really clear in Gad as we get through. But basically, one of the, the reason I mention that is because we talk about, and we'll see a little bit more today in Gad, the concept of replacement theology. And there are, there are groups like uh, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Calvinistic Protestants, and, and a few other groups that have a type of replacement theology and just theology proper. Basically, they say that the Lord got angry with the Jews, set them aside, will no longer have anything to do with them, and he's picked us or somebody to be the new group that he works with. And um, that's replacement theology proper, but there's another kind of replacement theology we don't re usually think about, and that is if I'm not a Jew, but I want to take everything that I at least think I know about Judaism and kind of rework the rituals and start up, say, the Kenites, followers of Ken. So, um, and we do whatever it is we do, that in itself can be a kind of replacement theology. So if you think about it, and I've wondered about this, even if the Catholic Church, for instance, didn't officially have a, a doctrine of replacement theology, suppose they were totally silent on it, didn't have it one way or the other, but the whole idea that they would have their own kind of priests, 
their own incense, their own rituals, their own kind of sacrifice. Um, and for instance, like in the fall, if you're Jewish, you're supposed to observe the 30 days of Elul for preparation and then the 10 High Holy Days. It's a 40-day period of the High Holy Days where you, you fast, you repent, you get right with the Lord. Well, the Catholics have a 40-day period, very similar, but it looks like they've taken it from the uh, fall and shifted it to the spring and call it Lent. Okay? And some people say all that stuff is pagan. And maybe some of it is and maybe some of it's not. But assuming that it's not pagan and that it's just a reworking of the Jewish rituals, I'm thinking not necessarily, but it could be looked at by God or by others as a form of replacement theology. You know, in other words, I'm doing it right now. They're doing it wrong, so they need to be stopped. Somehow it always goes back to the Jews are just messing up again because they're not doing it my way. Well, you're not supposed to be doing it, period. You know, it's, that's something. Or just like if I made a temple and started doing animal sacrifices, maybe I don't officially say I've replaced Israel, but I have my own way of doing it. And so that can actually manifest in a lot of things. One of the reasons I think that the Jews didn't like the Samaritans is because, well, supposedly they were foreigners, or at least intermingled. But, I mean, you could convert, so that shouldn't be a problem. But remember, they had their own sacrifices on Mount Gerizim. They didn't go to Jerusalem. And so for at least the, the uh, Orthodox rabbis of the Pharisaical or Pharisee branch, that's a no-no. You're not following directions. You're supposed to go up there and sacrifice. And you're saying, no, I'm not going up there. I'm going to go over here and sacrifice my way. So that could be a kind of replacement theology. I'm not doing it the proper way. I'm having my own rituals. So it's something to think about. We could do that as Protestants. We could do that as Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox or any other kind of thing, some sort of Jewish group. Another way of looking at it, too, um, you know, like they would say that, you know, we may not be, we're being anti-Semitic by doing what we're doing. If Jesus is the Messiah and Rabbi Shaul, Rabbi Paul, gave us the proper interpretation of the Torah, then anybody that goes against what Paul said and does their own thing, if it's different than Old Testament and different from Paul, could be a kind of replacement theology. That's a really weird way of looking at it. You know? And so, in other words, uh, Talmudic Judaism today, they would say, well, we don't have a temple, so there's no way we can sacrifice, so we just decided that giving of alms and good deeds replaces the temple sacrifices. Well, if it does, then that's fine, but did God say that? Or did somebody just decide on their own to redo Judaism? What about Kabbalah? Kabbalah might be legitimate, or it could be a reinterpretation of the Jewish Old Testament concepts. So I'm not saying those things necessarily are or are not replacement theology, but they could be especially when they all disagree with each other. If I can't be a Samaritan, and I understand they're almost died out, but I'm thinking there's like 20 or 50 Samaritans still left, so there's actually still sacrifices that go on at Mount Gerizim. That was the last I'd heard. I don't know if they've completely died out or not, but they're either right or they're wrong, so they're doing something right or wrong according to the scriptures, or maybe the scriptures, if we interpret it properly, maybe it doesn't matter. But it's just one of those things. I don't want to be the guy that tries to, either heretically or in good faith, try to steady the Ark of the Covenant and get killed for it because you're not supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. You know, those kind of, kind of things. Well, I'm a Christian, so obviously it won't bother me. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to chance that, you know. And uh, uh, Aaron's two sons bringing in strange fire. God wants it done this way. You don't just decide something else. So something in, to think about, and we'll, we'll cover that in detail as we go into um, chapters 3 and chapters uh, 9 of Gad, and I think it'll be a really interesting study. But today we are still in chapter 1, and basically what we've done, we started with 14, which showed an outline of a, a rapture, a tribulation period, uh, 
big battle of some sort, the establishment of a messianic kingdom. So putting that in light of Daniel, which would have written about 500 years after Gad, and the book of Revelation and the New Testament, another 500 years, it kind of sort of fits really well. We looked at chapter 2 and said there's going to be some sort of a system, actually two systems, that are replacement theology in some sort. They say that the Jews did something bad and now God, because of that, instead of just punishing him like they, God usually does, God won't have anything to do with them anymore, period. The prophecies are null and void or reworked or something. And so one of these, it says in there, is, is a group in Rome, Italy, that uh, is replacement theology that does understand there's a father, there's uh, an image, and a presence. So it is Trinitarian, and that's not the problem, or some of the other things that they do, but the fact that they say God hates the Jews and won't have anything to do with them, that kind of replacement theology. And there's another group, apparently, that does something similar, but they're not mentioned in chapter 2. So we got to chapter 1, and basically, he's told to go to the Kidron Valley and turn around and look toward the temple, what will, will, where the temple will be, but uh, the eastern gate. And um, he's uh, seeing this vision, and the vision basically is that there's a donkey and a camel coming up the road, leading two oxen that are yoked together. And this donkey and this camel, for some reason, are... I guess, evil, they're bad, misleading the oxen. And we, we said it's most likely Israel and Judah at this time, so the Jews who are supposed to create a kingdom of God on earth, and the Messiah is supposed to come through them, and peace is going to be ushered in, and everything should be right, but they're being misled somehow by this donkey and this camel. And so we, we see these things, and then all of a sudden, uh, he sees another vision, and let me get there here. The, the donkey and the camel are coming up, and then there's this voice that basically says uh, there are four mixtures of impurity. We talked about that last week, or two weeks ago, actually. And the pure and the impure are mixed, and basically it's four stages. There's impurity that comes and says, you must tolerate us, and we will tolerate you. If you're really righteous, you'll tolerate us. Everybody's got their own opinion. And so it goes from two groups. We should tolerate each other. Really, there's no difference. And then somehow righteousness becomes bigoted or evil and is stamped out. And then eventually the last stage is that evil begins saying, we, we're not only the righteous one that stamped out evil, there never really was any evil. We've always been. And so it you know, the new generation doesn't know anything about the old struggle, and everything is just like that. And we said today in our society we can see things like that because we that follow the scriptures, it just in society we battle the, uh, the abortion movement that wants to kill human beings, which is wrong according to scripture. Uh, we have the uh, gay and lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgender, you know, group, um, which... Scripture calls perversion, and I didn't write the Scriptures, and I don't really care one way or the other, but that's what the Scripture says, and so society comes and says, no, you're wrong. We have to tolerate each other, you know, and, and if, if that was to be let go, eventually it's, you, you're wrong, you need to be exterminated, and pretty soon they'll totally forget that there ever was a opposition to it, so those kind of things. We have the same possible thing over here if if we have a development of Islam. Islam's kind of the same way. Well, we just tolerate each other until there's a majority. Then they want to bring in Sharia law and change everything, which is not with our Constitution, and it's against Christian law, as what the Messiah Jesus said in the New Testament. So we have this concept of, of purity and impurity. Edom somehow rules over them, and we see that in Herod, being an Edomian ruling over putting the righteous one to death, and so that's mentioned in here. So he's seeing that, and this is where we pick up today um, in verse 11. And so basically what we're going to see here is that there's the sun appears, and there's a guy in the sun, that's God, and it's pretty obvious as we go down through it, 
And so that's God's represents God's kingdom you know, in heaven. And the, the moon is a reflection of God's kingdom of the sun on earth. And so that's what we're seeing. First, we see a full moon, which is reflecting God's kingdom, God's light, God's knowledge on earth. And he sees these appear, and then there's this donkey and the camel doing its thing. So here's what it says in verse 11. After this voice, he says, a great quake or earthquake occurred and shook over the impurity and blew the donkey and the camel to the moon with a stormy wind. So we're being told here that the donkey and the camel are, in some form anyway, this impurity that wants to destroy purity and mix it together. But they're blown to the moon. So the moon was opened and looked like a bow, like a semicircle, and both her points reached toward the ground. So in this vision, if you think about it, there's a sun and there's a moon. The moon is full. And the, something happens. There's an earthquake and a big, big wind. And the, the problem, guys, the, the impurity, is actually blown up to the moon. Well, when that happens, it becomes a crescent moon. So basically, you have the light of God being reflected to earth. And now the majority of the light of God is darkness. There's just a sliver. And of course, crescent moon also reminds me of Islam. I had a lady write to me at one point when I wrote the book on dreams and visions, saying that she kept having a reoccurring dream of a little girl with a necklace that has a crescent moon, but it wasn't Muslim, you know, like normal with the, it was with both points pointed down. Wondered if I'd ever studied it or run across anything like that. And I didn't, but it's in, in Gad now, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so this definitely could have something to do with Islam, but I think the major idea is that the majority of righteousness or God's light, God's kingdom, is now in darkness, which definitely happens when you take the scriptures, set them away like they did in the Middle Ages, and just have any particular church tell you what you need to believe. You know, and that would, depending on century after century, change a lot. So that's why we as Protestants usually want to get back to the scriptures. But then again, we as Protestant denominations tend to do that ourselves. We develop our pet doctrines, and somebody comes along and says, well, that doesn't seem to mesh with this verse. You're usually being told, well, you don't know Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, so be quiet and just, just follow directions. And the thing is, some things are confusing, but a lot of things are pretty simple in scripture. Important things are simple. And they're repeated over and over and over. There's not one verse that says that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. He's God incarnate. There's 27 verses in the New Testament that talk about his divinity. So if half of them are confusing, the other half are pretty clear. So you get the ideas behind it. Murder is wrong. I don't know who tells you it's not, but it's wrong. And it's pretty easy to understand. So this is what's happening. So the um, camel and the donkey are blown to the moon. It, becomes, it goes from being a full moon reflecting truth to a sliver of truth, mainly giving us darkness. So that's what they see. And then they have a vision of God. He says, then the sun came out of heaven and the sun became in, in the shape of a man with a crown on his head. And he was carrying over his right shoulder a lamb. And this lamb was despised and rejected. Sounds an awful lot like Isaiah. And we can begin to see here, this is God the Father and the lamb must be the Messiah. And on the crown, on his head, he had three shepherds. And these three shepherds in the crowns were actually shackled with 12 shackles. And these shackles were of gold, plated with silver. So I'm not exactly sure why it's gold plated with silver as opposed to silver plated with gold or half one or the other. I'm sure there's something there. But I think the thing that we can look at here is pretty straightforward. There are three shepherds, which obviously talk about it's a group of shepherds, so it's a group of something. And there's three of them. There's three divisions. Well, in Christianity, which is Gentile believers, basically, as far as the big three, 
you've got Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestants. So that may have something to do. Or if we're talking about kingdoms, you know, we had the, the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire, and then we had, you know, other things like that. But there's 12 shackles of gold, and 12 makes us think of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Not that Israel is a problem, but I think what might be going on here is these guys are shackled with the concept of the 12 tribes because they are allowing impurity to be mixed. Somehow they're getting confused because of some form of replacement theology. They're not understanding that there's Jews and that there's Gentiles, but somehow we are them. We've either replaced them, uh, we're better than them in our rituals or in our theology or both, and it's a problem. What do you do with this Jew idea? It's a weird problem we have to get rid of. We're struggling with it. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Now, later on, we're going to see three things and 12 things, but they're the pure form. This is the non-pure form. We have the 12 tribes of Israel. Some are saved, some are not. We've got the three branches of Christianity. Some are saved, some are not. We're just talking about the branches, the divisions of something. But he sees this, and then that's why on chapter, uh, page 17, I've got a picture of it. You see the, the eastern gate, just to try to get an idea in our head, and you see the crescent moon with the camel and the donkey over here, and then you see a guy with a uh, lamb on his right shoulder over here in the sun, so just to kind of get that. So then, then we see probably what's the Messiah's death. So he sees this. This is the sun, this guy with a crown and a lamb, and these three shepherds with the 12 shackles. He's looking at this. Then all of a sudden it says, the voice of the lamb was heard. So the voice, this lamb actually speaks, okay? It was great and dreadful like the voice of a lion roaring over its prey. So it's not, bah, little lamb that if I get mad at it, I could kill it. It won't ever hurt me in any way. It's a lamb, it opens up its mouth, and I hear the roar of a lion. And we don't think that much about that over here in America, but I can guarantee you if anybody's listening that lives in Africa, if you were setting out somewhere and all of a sudden you heard the roar of a lion about two feet, ten feet behind where you were sitting, you would probably think, I'm dead. Because they, they roar when they attack, they roar when they're getting their prey or to scare off anybody. And that's, that's pretty scary. I mean, can you imagine turning around and there's a bunch of lions right there that are kind of hungry. They're looking at you and licking their lips. How can you run away? You know, lions, you know, very, very scary. So this lamb acts like a lion and a prey. I mean, he's somebody that you don't want to mess with. And of course, in the New Testament and Old Testament as well, we see the lion and the lamb are symbols for the Messiah. But so he says, he does this, and this is what the lamb says. Woe to me, woe to me, woe to me. Again, I see lots of things in here are in threes. It reminds me of the Trinity. He says, woe to me. My image, and we saw in chapter 2, that's the reason why we did it first, that the concept is that there's God, an image, and a presence. A Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit. So we're talking about the Messiah here, the Son of God. My image has been diminished. My refuge has been lost. My lot and destiny has turned me over to my spoilers. And I was defiled until the evening by the touch of impurity. And so that's what this, this lamb says. Now, if we think about history as far as the New Testament con is concerned, what happened to Jesus? He came to his own, his own received him not. He was despised and rejected. He was put on the cross between the evenings at three in the afternoon. Uh, uh, the crucifixion happens. He hung, hangs on the cross until the evenings. They had to get him off before the actual evening Passover time started, which would be probably six o'clock or dusk. So he's defiled, because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, defiled by the touch of impurity which was an Edomite ruling over Judah. And the Pharisees and Sadducees that handed him over to be crucified, 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees were Jewish, but they weren't paying attention to the prophecies. They didn't accept the Messiah, didn't recognize him when he came. Maybe they could be kind of sort of thought of as a type of replacement theology. They weren't proper Jews in the way they should have been if the Messiah actually came and they didn't even notice or they rejected him on purpose. It's pretty spooky. Anyway, so this is what happens. So we see the Messiah apparently dying here. Now this next section is the Messiah's heart. And this is really interesting, I think. Verse 16 says, It came to pass when the voice of the Lamb ceased speaking, Lo, a man dressed in linen, that's this angel that we keep seeing back and forth, came with three vine branches and twelve palms in his hand. So here's the three and the twelve. Okay, Now the three that were shackled with the twelve, it was a problem because they were in impurity, not understanding this replacement theology stuff as defined in chapter 2. And the angel comes up to the Messiah, to the Lamb, with three vine branches and twelve palms. Now in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament also, the, the people that are in Messiah or in God are usually thought of as the vine branches. Jesus even said that in a parable, that he's the vine, you're the branches. Okay? Palm branches are usually thought of as, as a symbol of peace. When the Messiah rode in to Jerusalem, they had their palm branches, and they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is part of the ritual for Passover. So he, he takes these, and he takes these three branches, vine branches, and twelve palms in his hand, and he took the lamb from the hand of the Son, which is from the hand of the Father, and he put a crown on his head. So now the Messiah is being crowned king, and the vine branches and the palms he put on his heart. So it's pretty interesting. We have a time when the Messiah is taken from God and creates a kingdom on earth is what we're going to see. And it's really interesting because later on in here it's going to say, you left the Son to come create a kingdom, but you never left the Son. And I've heard some commentators say that, which is it, he either left or he didn't leave. Somebody messed up the text. And I don't think they messed up the text. I think it's a very clear indication that even when Jesus was here the first time and when he comes and sets up a kingdom, he's here in physical form. So in one sense, he's here, he's not with the Father. But in another sense, he's never left the Father and he will never leave the Father because he's one in, not one and the same, but he's part of the Trinity. So I think there's a whole lot of symbolism in here that, that reports to that. So he puts the vine branches and the palms on the Messiah's heart, gives him a crown, and then says this to him. Or, and then the man dressed in linen cried like a ram's horn, saying, What are you doing here, impurity? How did you get here, impurity? What, or, or that you have carved yourself a place to combine impurity with my covenant. And I have set, that I have set with the vine branches and the palms. So this, this is really interesting. So there's some form of impurity, which is this um, donkey and this camel. We know it's some form of replacement theology or a couple of forms of replacement theology. And somehow they combine themselves in God's whatever, in the Jews and the Christians and, the, you know, in God's kingdom, looking like God. But they combine their impurity, which is probably replacement theology, with the covenant, the covenant. There's just one, not two. Not saying that there's actually many covenants, but there's, he's talking about a specific covenant that he has set with the vine branches and the palms. Now, there's a, there's a covenant that was given on Sinai with the Jews. There's a covenant that was given to Abraham. There's a covenant that was given to Adam, one to Noah, one to David, one to the priests. So there's lots of covenants. But Jeremiah 31 says, in the latter days, or somewhere along later on, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay, 
And I, it's not going to be like the old covenant with the Aaronic code and the priest and the sacrifices and the, the laws on, carved on stone and this type. I'm going to put my laws on their hearts and in their minds so that they actually know to be able to understand. So it's a totally different kind of covenant. Now, it's not to the Gentiles specifically. It's to the house of Israel. Okay, but since it's that kind of a covenant, and we'll talk about this when we start looking at the law and how Gentiles, Noahides, Gars, um, different groups fit in with the Old Testament. And when we understand that and we come to the New Testament, we'll see how they fit in and how it changed or didn't change. And it'll be very, very specific. But there's this one covenant of Jeremiah 31 that's a new covenant. And Paul talks about it in depth in, in Hebrews and in other places in the New Testament. But this is interesting. So what's close to the Messiah's heart are the vine branches and the palms. So people from Christianity and people from Judaism, so to speak, Jews and, Jews and Gentiles in different systems that love the Messiah, that know their place. Okay, we don't try to replace the Jews. The Jews don't try to replace us. We don't try to kill anybody. God's doing whatever God is doing with whomever he's doing it. And we're waiting to see what he does. We're not trying to get to a place like Muslims who, because they interpret the Quran either correctly or not correctly, think they must enslave people. They must kill people. They must do this. They must do that. Um, those type of things. So... If the Jews have customs that they go by that Gentiles are not supposed to, according to the Jews, then that's fine. Uh, there's a problem if we start thinking what they do prevents them from being saved, or we have to do that, or they can't do that, or we can't do that. Or, uh, and Paul makes that very clear in the New Testament. But at this point, I think Gad is very clearly saying, here's the outline in chapter 14 of the end times. And chapter 2 basically simply tells us that there are these groups, and it, it, there's two big ones, obviously, but I'm sure there's a ton of teeny ones. Uh, Nazism, I think, would be a perfect example of a type of replacement theology. You know, they may not even have had a priesthood. They may not even have had an official, we're better than you, we've replaced you type deal. But they wanted them dead for whatever reason. So... You know, there's, there's several examples I'm sure we could take and look at that. But in this case, there's these replacement theology people, and they are impurity, and they're mixing with the, the, the pure. The Messiah comes and dies for the people, obviously. What's close to his heart are Jews and Gentiles both that love him, and the people that mix up the law because of the replacement theology, because of the impurity not just the people in Rome, which are the, probably the biggest single group of it, but those people are one of the ones that are struggling or having the problems that are chained by the Twelve. So altogether, it's actually a pretty consistent doctrine that we have to watch out for. And I think it's interesting that we're getting this now finally in English over here in America last year in 2016. And... I was, I was thinking of, it just dawned on me not too long ago, there's some other things. I've been studying the, how the Gentiles were supposed to do or not do parts of the laws in the same way or the similar way that the Jews were supposed to back in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is actually pretty clear. There are what's called Achim, which is like an idolater. Those people should be put to death. And under the law of Moses would be. In the time of Jesus, though, we're talking about Romans. They're going to worship their idols. They're going to do what they want. And you don't kill them. If you come against them, they kill you. So you just have to deal with it. So you've got these idolaters. Then you've got the, the Noahides, which are called gers. And there's a ger toshev and a ger zedek. And there's different forms. And each one does things differently or they have different privileges. But in Israel, they do certain things and don't do certain things. It's, but it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's very specific. And Paul, you know, makes mention of this too in the epistles. So we've got all these things. And one of the things I was thinking of is, is because a lot of the Jews don't like Noahides, don't like Christians, don't even recognize that they exist officially or that they should. 
and then some do. And the rabbis basically have said that if you want to come before a, rab a rabbinical council and say, I believe, I believe in the Noahide laws. I will not worship idols. I will do this. I will be moral, and I will worship the God of Israel. Then they say, great, you're a Gentile, kind of sort of a brother, but don't get too, yeah. So you're okay, you know, in our book. And so one of the things was is that they, they have to investigate and then declare you to be a Noahide. But there's a, there's a problem with that because if you're a Canaanite and you were sold into slavery, then uh, you're just a slave until you die. Okay, that was part of the old law. A Jew that sells himself into slavery, we're talking about if you get on hard times or you or you steal something and you're made to pay it back and it happened to be a million dollar gem and you lost it or whatever, you, you, get, you get enslaved to pay the, the money back. But at the end of the seven years, the, you go free. It doesn't matter how many years you, you were in there paying. But now a, a Gertoshav, a Gentile, he doesn't go free until the Jubilee year. So there's three different groups here. But the problem is, there's no jubilee year until there's a Sanhedrin to declare a jubilee year. There hasn't been a Sanhedrin for 2,000 years. So the rabbi said, you can declare yourself one and we'll kind of sort of recognize you, but we can't really do anything with it. Well, the Sanhedrin was reestablished in 2004. And for the first time in 2,000 years, last fall, we had the Sanhedrin do the ritual that actually recognized the Jubilee year. So now, just in the last few months, it is actually possible for the Jews to officially recognize, and I don't know if they're even doing it yet or not, Noahides, uh, Friends of Israel in this part, and, and this is creating a whole new movement now that just now is being able to be recognized. And so it's really interesting to see what happens. So Gad comes out, which helps us understand this. We'll and find out in later chapters. And we're just seeing another birth of another form of the Messianic movement. First we had Jews, some of them that converted to Christianity, and then back in the, in the, the, the 70s really is where the big push for Messianic synagogues, Messianic Judaism comes. And then there's this other group. And so people are beginning to understand more and accept more. And it's all kind of pointing to the whole idea of all these groups coming together, eventually in studying this stuff to make sure we're doing it right, or them, I should say, Israel, Paul says there's going to be a time when all Israel accepts Messiah. You know, it's going to be a little while yet, I'm sure, but it's just amazing that these things are happening. God allowed this to come out last year. Last year was the first official uh, Jubilee announcement. We have a Sanhedrin back. It's only been like a, a decade or two. Uh, we have the Messianic movement from really getting big from the 70s. A lot of things that are new, that are that have been predicted. Nothing as far as a specific prophecy, but several movements going toward closer and closer to what Paul said would happen. So it, it's really amazing in that way. So at this point, we will probably go ahead and stop, but I wanted to um, make sure we understood that. So we've uh, covered that, and next time we'll go through and probably finish chapter 1, uh, talking about God's final judgment on this type of impurity, the establishment of a messianic kingdom, and there's this group because of it called the redeemed. We saw a... a glimpse of it in chapter 14 that they exist, but there's actually a song of the redeemed. And when you read this, you understand the redeemed actually are the vine branches and the, uh, the palms, the ones that are close to the Messiah's heart. The people that have been sinners and were sinners and deserve death, but somehow because of the Messiah's being touched by impurity, now are the redeemed. You know, and it's pretty cool. They've repented of their sins. But in this whole thing, we have a whole concept of salvation. But the major thing is the outline of a seven-year period and a tribulation and a rapture, uh, a redeemed group of both Jews and Gentiles, and another group of Jews and Gentiles 
that have messed up royally with some form of replacement theology, getting bogged down with it. And it's actually not that hard to figure out. So really, really interesting with uh, Gad.